Chapter 4 The Donahadi lifeboat went to sea again at 7am on the Sunday morning, in eerie post-storm calm conditions. They found scattered bits of wreckage and took on board the bodies of 11 men, one woman and, ch- and a child. There was not one soul found alive, and all of the remaining bodies were lost to sea. That very same day, Margaret, in shock, performed the grisly task of identifying bodies on the quayside of the Donaghy Harbour. Her beloved's body was never found. Margaret never recovered, and with a year, within a year she died of a broken heart. At a memorial service, attended by over a thousand people in the parish church at Banger, the Bishop of Down said in his address that Walter Smiles died as he lived, a good, brave, unselfish man who lived up to the command, Look not every man to his own things, but every man also to the good of others. Almost a hundred years earlier to the day, Samuel Smiles had written the final pages of his book Self Help. It included this moving tale of heroism as an example for the Victorian Englishman to follow. For the fate of my great grandfather, Walter, it was poignant in the extreme. The vessel was steaming along the African coast with 472 men, 166 women and children on board. The men consisted principally of recruits who had only been a short time in the service. At two o'clock in the morning, while all were asleep below, the ship struck with a violence upon a hidden rocks, rock which penetrated her bottom and was, in, and was at once felt that she would go down. The roll of the drums called the soldiers to arms on the upper deck and the men mustered as if on parade. The word was passed to save the women and children and the helpless creatures were brought from below, mostly undressed and handed silently into the boats. When they had all left the ship's side, the commander of the vessel thoughtlessly called out, All those who can swim, jump overboard and make for the boats. But Captain Wright of the 91st Highlanders said, No, if you do that... The boats with the women will be swamped, so the brave men stood motionless. Not a heart quailed, no one flinched from his duty. There was not a murmur, not a cry amongst them, said Captain Wright, a survivor, until the vessel made her final plunge. Down went the ship, and down went the heroic band, firing a volley shot of joy as they sank beneath the waves. Glory and honour to the gentle and the brave. The examples of such men never die, but, like their memories, they are immortal. As a young man, Walter undoubtedly would have read and known these words from his grandfather's book, poignant in the extreme. Indeed, the examples of such men never die, like their memories, they are immortal. Chapter 5 Margaret's daughter Patsy, my grandmother, was in the prime of her life when the Princess Victoria sank. The media descended on the tragedy with reportage full of heroism and sacrifice. Somehow, the headlines dulled Patsy's pain for a while. In a rush of grief-induced media frenzy, Patsy found herself winning a by-election to take over her father's Ulster seat in Parliament. The glamorous, beautiful daughter takes over the heroic father's political seat. It was a script made for a film. But life isn't celluloid, and the glamour of Westminster would exact a dreadful toll on Northern Ireland's youngest ever female MP. Patsy had married Neville Fort, my grandfather, a gentle giant of a man and one of seven brothers and sisters. Neville's father had been the Dean of York and headmaster of Harrow School. His brother Richard, a young sporting prodigy, had died suddenly and unexpectedly a day before his 16th birthday, while a pupil at Eton, one of Neville's one of, while a pupil at Eton. And one of Neville's other brothers, Christopher, had been tragically killed in Anzio during the Second World War. But Neville survived, and he shone. Voted the best-looking man at Oxford, he was blessed not only with good looks, but also a fantastic sporting eye. He played top-level country county cricket and was feted in the newspapers as a huge hitter of sixes, with innings amount becoming of his six-foot-three frame. But marrying the love of his life, Patsy, was where his heart lay. He was as content as any man can hope to be living with his bride in rural Cheshire. 
He took up a job with Wiggins Teep, the paper manufacturers, and together he and Patsy began to raise a small family in the countryside. For Patsy, to follow so publicly in her father's footsteps was a decision that troubled Neville. However, he knew that it would change all of their lives drastically, but he consented all the same. The glamour of Westminster was intoxicating for his young wife and the Westminster corridors were equally intoxicated by the bright and beautiful Patsy. Neville waited and watched patiently from their home in Cheshire, but in vain. It wasn't long before Patsy became romantically involved with a member of Parliament. The MP vowed to leave his wife if Patsy left Neville. It was a clichéd, empty promise. But the tentacles of power had firmly grasped the young Patsy. She chose to leave Neville. It was a decision that she regretted until her dying day. Sure enough, the MP never left his wife, yet by now Patsy had burnt her bridges and life moves ever on. But the damage that would affect our family was done, and for Neville and Patsy's two young daughters, Sally, my mother, and her sister Mary Rose, their world was turning. For Neville, it was beyond heartbreaking. Patsy was soon wooed by another politician, Nigel Fisher, and this time she married him. But from early on in their marriage, Patsy's new husband, Nigel, was unfaithful. <clears throat> Yet she stayed with him and bore the burden with the flawed conviction that somehow this was God's punishment to her for leaving Neville, the one man who had ever truly loved her. Patsy raised Sally and Mary Rose, and she went on to achieve so much with her life, including founding one of Northern Ireland's most successful charities, the Women's Caring Trust, that still today helps communities come together through music, the arts, and even climbing. Climbing has always been in the family blood. Granny Patsy was loved by many and had that great strength of character that her father and grandfather had shown. But somehow, that regret from her early life never really left her. She wrote a very poignant but beautiful letter on life to Lara, my sister, when she was born, that ended like this. Save the moments of sheer happiness, like a precious jewel. They come unexpectedly and with an intoxicating thrill. But there will also be moments, of course, when everything is black. Perhaps someone you love dearly may hurt or disappoint you, and everything may seem too difficult or utterly pointless. But remember always that everything passes and nothing stays the same. And every day brings a new beginning. And nothing, however awful, is completely without hope. Kindness is one of the most important things in life and can mean so much. Try never to hurt those that you love. We all make mistakes, and sometimes terrible ones. But try not to hurt anyone for the sake of your own selfishness. Try always to think ahead and not backwards. Don't ever try to block out the past because that's part of you and it's made you what you are. But try, oh try to learn a little bit from it. It wasn't until the final years of her life that Neville and Patsy became almost reunited. Neville now lived a few hundred yards from the house that I grew up in as a teenager on the Isle of Wight. And Patsy in her old age would spend long summers living with us there as well. The two of them would take walks together and sit on the bench overlooking the sea, but Neville always struggled to let her in close again, despite her warmth and tenderness to him. Neville had held 50 years of pain after losing her, and such pain is hard to ignore. As a young man, I would often watch her slip her fingers into his giant hand, and it was beautiful to see. I learnt two very strong lessons from them. The grass isn't always greener elsewhere, and true love is worth fighting for. Chapter 6 During the first few years of my life, all school holidays were spent at Port Arvo Port in Donaghadee, Donah on the northern Irish coast, the same house where my great-grandfather Walter lived, and so, near, so, and so near to where he ultimately died. I loved that place. The wind off the sea and the smell of the salt water penetrated every corner of the house. The taps creaked when you turned them on and the beds were so cold, were so old and high that I could only reach into mine by climbing up the bedstead. I remember the smell of that old Yamaha outboard engine in the ancient wooden boat that my father would carry down to the shore to take us out in in calm days. I remember walks through the woods with bluebells in full bloom. I especially loved hiding and running amongst the trees, getting my father to try and find me. I remember being pushed by my sister Lara on a skateboard down the driveway and crashing into the fence or lying in bed beside Granny Patsy. 
both of us ill with measles, quarantined to the garden shed to keep us away from everybody else. I remember swimming in the cold sea and eating boiled eggs every day for breakfast. In essence, it was the place where I found the lo my love of the sea and of the wild. But I didn't know it at the time. Conversely, the school term times would be spent in London where my father worked as a politician. It was a strange or not so strange irony that my mother married a future MP. After witnessing the dangerous power of politics firsthand growing up with Patsy as her mother. When my parents married, Dad was working as a wine importer, having left the Royal Marine Commandos, where he'd served as an officer for three years. He then went on to run a small wine bar in London before finally seeking election as a local councillor and subsequently as a Member of Parliament for Chertsey, just south of London. More importantly, my father was, above all, a good man. Kind, gentle, fun, loyal and loved by many. But growing up, I remember those times spent in London as quite lonely for me. Dad was working very hard and often late into the evenings and Mum, as his assistant, worked beside him. I struggled, missing just having time together as a family, calm and unhurried. Looking back, I craved some peaceful time with my parents and it's probably why I behaved so badly at school. I remember once biting a boy so hard that I drew blood and then watching the teachers as they rang my father to say that they didn't know what to do with me and came down to the school at once. With a chair placed in the middle of the gym and all the children sitting cross-legged on the floor around him, he whacked me until my bum was black and blue. The next day, I slipped my mother's hand my, I slipped my mother's hand in a busy London street and ran away, only to be picked up by the police some hours later. I wanted attention, I guess. My mother was forever having to lock me away in my bedroom for troublemaking, but she would then get concerned that I might run out of oxygen, so I had a car she had a carpenter make air holes in the door. They say that necessity is the mother of all invention, and I soon worked out that with a bent-over coat hanger, I could undo the latch through the air holes and escape. It was my first foray into the world of adapting and improvising, and those skills have served me well over the years. At the same time, I was also developing a love of the physical. Mum would take me every week to a small gymnasium for budding gymnasts run by the unforgettable Mr Sturgis. The classes were held in a dusty old double garage behind a block of flats in Westminster. Mr Sturgis ran the classes with iron, ex-military di discipline, we each had spots on the floor denoting where we should stand rigidly to attention, awaiting our next task. As he pushed us hard, it felt like Mr Sturgis had forgotten that we were only age six, but as kids, we loved it. It made us feel special. We would line up in rows beneath a metal bar, some seven feet off the ground, and then one by one we would say, Up please, Mr Sturgis, and he would lift us up and down and leave us hanging as he continued down the line. The rules were simple. You were not allowed to ask permission to drop off until the whole row was up and hanging like dead pheasants in a game larder. And even then you had to request, down please, Mr Sturgis, if you buckled. If you buckled and dropped off prematurely, you were sent back in shame to your spot. I found I loved these sessions and took great pride in determining to be the last man hanging. My mum would say that she couldn't bear to watch me as my skinny little body hung there and my face purple and contorted in blind determination to stick it out until the bitter end. One by one, the other boys would drop off the bar and I would be left hanging there, battling to endure until the point where even Mr Sturgis would, was, um, would decide it was time to call it. I would then scuttle back to my mark, grinning from ear to ear. Down please, Mr Sturgis, became a family phrase for us as an example of hard physical exercise, strict discipline and foolhardy determination, all of which would serve me well later in military days. So my training was pretty well-rounded. Climbing, hanging, escaping. I loved them all. Mum, still to this day, says that growing up I seemed to be destined to be a mix of Robin Hood, Harry Houdini, John the Baptist and an assassin. I took it as a great compliment. My favourite times in that era were Tuesdays after school when I would go to my Granny Patsy's flat for tea and to spend the night. I remember the smell there was a mix of silk-cut cigarettes and the baked beans and fish fingers she cooked me for tea. But I loved it. It was the only place away from home that I wasn't ever homesick. 
When my parents were away, I would often be sent to spend the night in the house of an older lady who I didn't know and who didn't seem to know me either. I assume it was a friendly neighbour or acquaintance, or at least I hope it was. I hated it. I remember the smell of old leather fo- the old leather photo frame containing a picture of my mum and dad that I would cling to in the strange bed. I was too young to understand that my parents would be coming back soon. But it taught me another big lesson. Don't leave your children if they don't want you to. Life and their childhood is so short and fragile. Through all these times and formative young years, Lara, my sister, was a rock to me. My mother had suffered three miscarriages after having Lara, and eight years on, she was convinced that she wasn't going to be able to have more children. But mum got pregnant, and she tells me that she spent nine months in bed to make sure she didn't miscarry. It worked. Mum saved me. The end result was, though, that she probably was pleased to get me out and that Lara finally got herself a precious baby brother, or in effect, her own baby. So Lara and I ended up doing, Lara ended up doing everything for me, and I adored her for it. Whilst Mum was a busy working mother, helping my father in his constituency duties and beyond, Lara became my surrogate mum. She fed me almost every supper I ate, from when I was a baby to up to about five years old. She changed my nappies, she taught me to speak, then to walk. With so much attention from her, of course, happened, this happened ridiculously early. She taught me how to get dressed and brush my teeth. In, en- in essence, she got me to do all the things that either she had been too scared to do herself, or that just simply intrigued her, such as eating raw bacon or riding a tricycle down a steep hill with no brakes. I was the best rag doll of a baby brother that she could have ever dreamt of. It is why we've always been so close. To her, I'm still her little baby brother and I love her for that. But this, but, and this is a big but, growing up with Lara, there was never a moment's peace. Even from day one, as a newborn babe in the hospital's maternity ward, I was paraded around, shown off to any, everyone and anyone. I was my sister's new toy and it never stops. It makes me smile now, but I'm sure it is why in later life that I craved the peace and solitude that the mountains and the sea bring. I didn't want to perform for anyone, I just wanted space to grow and find myself amongst all the madness. It took a while to understand where this love of the wild came from, but in truth it probably developed from the intimacy I found with my father on the shores of Northern Ireland and the will to escape a loving but bossy elder sister, God bless her. I can joke about this nowadays with Lara, and though she still remains my closest ally and friend, but she is always the extrovert, wishing she could be on the stage or on the chat show couch where I didn't tend to, where I tend just to long for the quiet times with my friends and family. In short, Lara would be much better at being famous than me. She sums it up well, I think. Until Bear was born, I hated being the only child. I complained to mum and dad that it was lonely. It felt weird not having a brother or sister when all my friends had them. Bear's arrival was so exciting once I got over the disappointment of him being a boy because I'd wanted a sister. But the moment I set eyes on him, crying his eyes out um, in his crib, I thought, that's my baby. I'm going to look after him. I picked him up. He stopped crying. And from then on, and I picked him up. He stopped crying. And from then until he got too big, I dragged him around everywhere. One of the redeeming factors in my early years in smoky London was that I got to join the Scouts age six, and I loved it. I remember my first day at Scouts, walking in and seeing all these huge boys with neatly pressed shirts, covered in awards and badges. I was, t- I was a tiny, skinny squirt in comparison, and I felt even smaller than I... Than, um, than I looked. But as soon as I heard the scoutmaster challenging us to cook a sausage with just the one match on the pavement, I was hooked. One match, one sausage, mm, but it will never burn long enough, I thought. Then I was shown how first to use the match to light a fire, then to cook the sausage. It was a eureka moment for me. If anyone present during those scout evenings had been told that one day I would hold the post of chief scout and be the figurehead of up to 28 million scouts worldwide, they would have probably died of laughter. But what I lacked in stature and confidence, I always made up for with guts and determination. And those are qualities that really matter both in the game of life and in scouting. So I found great release in scouting and great camaraderie as well. It was like a family and it didn't matter what your background was. 
If you were a scout, you were a scout, and that was what mattered. I liked that, and my confidence grew.